Good morning, my friend. I am looking at a beautiful sunrise outside. It is a gorgeous day here. I got an email from a reader named Matthew, a guy from Nebraska, and he said something that kind of kind of took my breath away. Here's what he said. I believe we all have those moments in our lives where we cannot see the forest from the trees and believe that our faith is weak, insufficient, or misplaced. I am as guilty as anyone of focusing myopically on what my own issues are and losing the perspective that often when we focus on what we've lost, we fail to see what we've gained. That's a reader, Matthew, from Nebraska. Now, if you've been reading or listening to me for very long, my friend, you know that I'm pretty weird and that I love science. And Matthew's email reminded me of a physics principle that when you put gas into a container, that gas will expand to fill the entire container. You can't stop it from filling the entire container. No matter how much gas you put in, even a tiny amount, it's going to expand until it fills the entire container. And it's funny to me that the more successful my podcast becomes, the harder it is for me to create new episodes. I guess I'm feeling this pressure, this burden, trying to make sure that every episode is as good or quote-unquote helpful or good as previous episodes. But what's interesting is that I usually just bring you what's on my heart. That's what I've always done. Just sort of prayed and felt like God led me to talk about whatever needed to be talked about. But this particular episode has been gnawing at me. I've been, I've been thinking about it for quite a while now. I've been procrastinating. I've been dragging my feet because I wanted this episode to be ready and it doesn't feel ready yet. And I didn't want to just sub it with something else. I could have grabbed some other idea that was easier and and gone and recorded a different episode. But I've really felt like this is what we were supposed to talk about. So although I think the things we're going to talk about today could end up, re- probably will end up needing several other episodes in the future to accomplish and to fully flesh out, I just want to get this on your radar And we want to talk about what I call the physics of suffering and the physics of joy because those laws that govern suffering and joy are the same as the laws that determine the behavior of a gas in a container. In other words, suffering and joy will both expand to fill up whatever room in your life and your heart you give them. They just will. You can't stop it. If you give suffering or joy the adequate amount of volume, they will expand to fill it up. And that's it. I could stop now and we'd be done. But of course, you didn't download this to hear a three-minute intro and be finished with it. There are more thoughts to discuss from Matthew's email. There are three writers whose work will help us shed some light on the topic of how we can fill our hearts and lives up with meaning and purpose and joy, no matter what we're facing. And so, my friend, today we're going to talk about suffering, about joy, and about how to make the switch from one to the other. And as always, we're going to start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. I've been reading a book. It's one of those books that, it's funny, we talk about it in med school. Every time we took a psychiatry class, we talk about Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's one of those books that you hear about if you lose a child or you go through something hard, you always hear about this book. And somehow it had always been on my radar. I actually had it in my Kindle library, but I'd never actually read it. I'm not sure how. I'd read lots of excerpts from it. I've quoted it before. I've spent a lot of time thinking about Viktor Frankl and the fact that he was in a concentration camp during the Second World War and he lost his wife and his parents and his brother and he went through a lot. He was at Auschwitz and other camps. But somehow I never actually read the book. So now I'm reading it. Here's the 
intro from or the uh, explanation of this book from Amazon. Let me just read it to you. Psychiatrist Victor Frankel's memoir has riveted generations of readers with its descriptions of life in Nazi death camps and its lessons for spiritual survival. Between 1942 and 1945, Frankel labored in four different camps, including Auschwitz, while his parents, brother, and pregnant wife perished. Based on his own experience and the experiences of others he treated later in his practice, Frankel argues that we cannot avoid suffering, but we can choose how to cope with it, find meaning in it, and move forward with renewed purpose. Frankel's theory, known as logotherapy from the Greek word logos, meaning, holds that our primary drive in life is not pleasure, as Freud maintained, but the discovery and pursuit of what we personally find meaningful. At the time of Frankel's death in 1997, man's search for meaning had sold more than 10 million copies in 24 languages. A 1991 reader survey from the Library of Congress that asked readers to name a book that made a difference in their lives found Man's Search for Meaning among the 10 most influential books in America. That's from Amazon. And here's a passage from the foreword that Victor Frankl wrote himself. Quote, I do not at all see in the bestseller status of my book an achievement and accomplishment on my part, but rather an expression of the misery of our time. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of meaning to life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. Victor Frankl said that. And look, this is the whole purpose behind my whole idea of being infinitely happier. You've got somebody like Dan Harris that can write a book called 10% Happier, and it's multiple bestseller, multiple million selling copy bestseller. Because people are out there facing the reality that life is hard. And if you don't have that spiritual component, you can't find yourself more than 10 or 15% happier, no matter what you do. But Dan Harris says that's enough. Just just learning how to think differently made him 10% happier. Victor Frankl came at this from the standpoint of a psychoanalyst, of how to figure out how to help people get to the answer to that question that burns under their fingernails. What is the meaning of life? How can I find purpose and meaning in this hard life? Frankel's book, actually, I'm finding, is very spiritual, even though I don't think he intended for it to be. He wasn't really a spiritual guy, it seems. But my idea is that if you add in what you're made for, which I believe is your spirit, the future life of a spirit, uh, redeemed life of a person who's going to spend eternity with their maker, If you add in the things that he tells us, that the Bible tells us, will make you happier, then you can not just be 10% happier. You can't just be somewhat more meaningful and purposeful in your life, but you can actually find infinite joy and infinite happiness. That's the premise, okay? Here's something else uh, that Viktor Frankl said. In spite of all the enforced physical and mental primitiveness of the life in a concentration camp, it was possible for spiritual life to deepen. Sensitive people who were used to a rich intellectual life may have suffered much pain. They were often of a delicate constitution. But the damage to their inner selves was less. They were able to retreat from their terrible surroundings to a life of inner riches and spiritual freedom. So this idea is that no matter what you're going through, there are some people who can find themselves actually improving spiritually, improving mentally while going through hard things. That's kind of what I talked about in my book. I've seen the interview. I saw people like Joey who encountered fatal cancer and actually got better in terms of their life and their quality of life and their mental state as they were dying from their disease. So something's up with those folks. Something's up with those folks who can face hard things and get better, get happier, find joy, find purpose, and find meaning. And that that's a book, the the mean the um, Man's Search for Meaning book by Viktor Frankl is a book that's written to examine this very thing, the psychology of suffering and man's need to find meaning and purpose in his days. But it turns out to be really a spiritual book. Like I said, even though he didn't write it for that purpose, if you allow yourself to see the parallels, and I'm going to give you some of those parallels today so that we can talk about how we find meaning and purpose and why it matters so much. Now let's start with looking at the Apostle Paul. Of course, you know his story probably. He's a a very educated Jewish scholar named Saul who had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and became a Christian. He had been a person who formally persecuted and even executed Christians, and now he was the apostle being appointed to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And in response to that, he got in a lot of trouble. He was beaten, he was flogged, he was imprisoned. In fact, he wrote four letters in the New Testament 
that are commonly now known as the prison epistles. The books of Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians. I'm sorry I'm having a little drainage in my throat today, so my voice is a little weird. These four books are called the prison epistles because they were written from prison. And the most interesting part of that is that these four books are so full of talk about how to find peace and joy despite our circumstances. Look at Philippians 3.1. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. So Paul is in prison, in a Roman prison, which probably didn't have the same kind of rights and privileges American prisons do. And he's saying, hey, I'm writing these things to you so you won't get tired of finding joy no matter what happens. I'm doing it to safeguard your faith. So in that context, we can see that Paul is telling us that the way to safeguard your heart is to try to find joy in whatever happens to you. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Always be full of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry. He says in another translation, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now be ready. Here comes the self-brain surgery part. Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What he's done here, he's telling you to find joy no matter what, and he's telling you how to do it. Choose what you think about. Reframe your thinking. Try to decide in your heart that you're not going to focus on the hard stuff. You're going to focus on better stuff. You're going to think about better things. And so here we have Viktor Frankl, who's literally in a concentration camp facing death at any moment, and Paul in a Roman prison also facing death at any moment, both coming to the same conclusion. And here it is. Your sense of peace and happiness largely comes, my friend, from what you choose to think about. Viktor Frankl discovered that he could think about his wife, and he didn't yet know that she was already dead along with their unborn child. He didn't know, yet know that his parents and his brother were already dead, but he could think about his wife, and he would feel joy no matter what the Nazis were doing to him. He writes this beautiful passage where he was in a work camp, and bad things were happening. He was miserable. He was freezing. He was starving to death, but he draws to mind this picture of his wife, and he, he listens to her voice. He can see her face and hear her voice, and here's what he said. Real or not, her look was then more luminous than the sun which was beginning to rise. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers, the truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understand how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. That's amazing. So here you have Paul in a horrible prison for the sin of believing in Jesus, and he writes about having joy in all times and all circumstances, and even backs it up by saying, and again I say, rejoice. I can think about right now, I can think about my son Mitchell, who died tragically in 2013. I can think about him, and I can make a choice. I can think about seeing him in that funeral home, in that hastily prepared body, and the stab wounds in his neck. And I can think about the injustice of it all, and how he lost out on his life, and how we don't get to see him, and he's not going to bury me someday, and I don't get to see his children grow up, and he never gets to fall in love. And I can work myself into this oblivion of dark thoughts about losing my son. And it's true, and it's honest, and it's real, and it's not negative. It's just what it is. I'm just actually allowing myself to think about all the things related to losing my son. Or I can think about his beautiful face and his hysterical sense of humor, and I can think about his laugh and his voice and his insight and his heart for hurting people, and I can think about the way he loved music and the way his delicate hands played that bass guitar, and I can think about how he always found something 
a little off, a little orthogonal to everybody else's sense of humor, and he made people laugh, and he made people cry with humor, and he just he loved people. And I can think about how he was never comfortable in his own skin, so he was always really sensitive to other people's insecurities and trying to point out that they had a hard time and how to help them, how to help me see their problems so I could make them feel better. I can think about those things, and I can see Mitch, and I can rejoice in him and the beautiful person that he was and still is, and the, and the fact that I get to see him in the in the resurrection someday. I get to make that choice. And you do too, friend. Whatever you're facing, you get to make a choice of how you frame those thoughts in your brain. Now, I told you this episode was about the physics of gas. And here's what uh, Frankel said. Suffering completely fills the human soul and the conscious mind, no matter whether the suffering is great or little. Therefore, the size of human suffering is absolutely relative. And that is an That is one of the most true, honest statements I've ever read anybody write because you can get yourself all worked into a miserable state of mind over being late for work or over spilling your coffee or over somebody getting promoted ahead of you. You can decide that that's the worst thing that's ever going to happen to you and you can become completely miserable in your life over it. Or you can be in a concentration camp and about to be sent to the gas chamber and you can find joy in a sunset or in the memory of your wife. You get to choose that. You get to choose, friend. You get to do the brain surgery to set what you're going to think about and how you're going to feel about the things that happen in your life. You see it? No matter what you're going through, if you let it, that thing will expand to fill up your entire mind and your entire heart and your entire life. And that is the problem with the physics of suffering. The problem is there's no end to it. There's no end to suffering and trouble in this life. If you haven't noticed, nobody gets out of planet Earth alive. I'm sorry to say it, I'm not trying to be negative, but everybody you know will eventually die, either before or after you. God forbid that your children die before you, but somebody listening to this has already been through that or will go through it. Everyone you know is going to pass away unless the Lord comes back. Everybody you know is going to perish. There is no end to the suffering and the trouble in this life because it's a temporary life. There's no end to comparisons. There's no end to the ability that you have of seeing somebody else and fantasizing that they have something better than you do or to looking back and thinking that something in your past was better than something now. There's no end to worry and stress and sickness. So the secret cannot be avoiding those things. The secret to happiness and joy cannot be found in figuring out how to avoid hardship because you can't. The secret has to be found in learning how to be happy anyway. The secret has to be to let the joy in your heart expand like a gas to push out the suffering and let the joy and the peace and the hope and the faith in your heart be the thing that fills up the available space in your life. We've talked a lot in previous episodes. I've written a lot about Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations that we think he wrote because I think it's it's worth remembering. It's worth spending some time in Lamentations chapter 3. The people are in trouble. There's real peril here. They are in, in danger. He is really hosed. The situation is dire. But in Lamentations 3, we see a great example of brain sur- self-brain surgery in action to take suffering and replace it with hope. I'm going to read the whole thing to you, at least the first several verses. He says this, Jeremiah says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. Now, just start right there. He's putting himself in the position of, I've got it worse than anybody else has it. He is, I'm the man who's seen affliction. I'm the guy who knows about trouble, right? He goes on, he has driven me away. He has made me walk in darkness. He has turned his hand against me. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Boy, he's really beating himself up here. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song. All day long, he has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. 
He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone. And all that I hoped from the Lord. Look, listen to what he's doing. He has decided that God has beaten him up more than anybody else, that he's got it worse than anybody else, and that he's even been deprived of peace. And then he concludes by saying, I'm just done for. My splendor's gone. I'm, I'm hosed. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering. He's remembering. He's choosing to think about the hard stuff. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Now, I don't know what happened here. I don't know if Jeremiah is thinking all this stuff and he gets a text message from a friend or something happens, but something changes his mind right here. He's in the middle of all this dark stuff. He's bitter. He's angry. He's hurt. He's brokenhearted, and he says, I will remember my suffering. I will remember my affliction. I will always remember that my soul is downcast within me. But then something amazing happens right here. Verse 21, he says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Another translation says, I hold on to hope. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Another translation says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will wait for him. It is good for those to hope in the Lord. It is good. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seek him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So here you have a guy, Jeremiah who is miring, he's down in the muck and the mire of human suffering. And it's legit. He really is actually going through a really hard time. But he made a decision. Remember I told you a few episodes ago, please go listen to Hope is a Verb a few episodes back. That is a good episode, and it's going to help you. to Go back and listen to it. Jeremiah decided to remember that hope is a verb. He chose, he called to mind, he chose to hope, he chose to fight for faith. Viktor Frankl said it like this. In the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. Listen, hear that again. It becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of influence, camp influences alone. Fundamentally, therefore, any man can, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him mentally and spiritually. He may retain his human dignity even in a concentration camp. Dostoevsky said, There is only one thing that I dread, and that is not to be worthy of my sufferings. Frankel goes on, and there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. Remember this, Jesus said in John 10 that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but he has come, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And he's saying that in the context of a hard life. Frank says you get to make a choice whether or not you will become the plaything of your circumstances there's a poem by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that was written in 1943 called remembrance not really a poem but a, a, a epitaph of some sort Bonhoeffer wrote my friend Hank Yon who recently lost his wife Annika to a glioblastoma brain tumor quoted this poem from Bonhoeffer in her funeral he invited me to watch Uh, the funeral service. Lisa and I got up early one Saturday morning and watched the service in Holland. And it was beautiful and and sad and and tragic and amazing all at the same time. But Hank Yon gave the final thoughts and he quoted Bonhoeffer here. Remembrance. Here's what he says. First of all, there's nothing that can replace the absence of a loved one. And one shouldn't try that either. One has to bear it and persevere. That sounds very harsh, but at the same time, it is a great comfort because the void is not filled. One remains connected by these. It is wrong to say that God fills the void. He does not fill it. But instead, he keeps it open and therefore helps us, albeit with pain, to preserve our community 
Then, the more beautiful and full the memory, the more difficult it is to be separated. But gratitude turns the pain of memory into silent joy. You no longer wear the beautiful that has passed as a prickle, but as a precious gift to you. Now, Bonhoeffer died in a Nazi prison. They killed him for the crime of being a Christian and for not supporting Hitler. Bonhoeffer died in that German prison, but he could write those things because the Nazis couldn't take his joy away because Bonhoeffer performed self-brain surgery. He chose not to become the plaything of his difficult circumstances. Now, this is the choice of Frankel, it's the choice of Paul, it's the choice of Jeremiah, it's the choice of Hankion, it's the choice of me after losing my child, of Lisa after losing her child. It's a choice of everyone who finds a way to smile in the face of a hard life. The opposite choice is that of the addict, the hopeless, the depressed, the suicide victim. If you choose to let the suffering fill up the available space in your life, there is no end to how much of that you will find. It is a choice, friend. No one accidentally finds themselves happy or at peace. You have to fight for it. It's a Hobson's choice. You take it or leave it. You get to be happy or you get to not be happy. And it's yours for the taking. If you do what James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds because you're going to. So you get to choose whether or not to be joyful. Now let's go back to Matthew's email. I believe we all have those moments in our lives where we cannot see the forest from the trees and believe that our faith is weak, insufficient, or misplaced. I'm as guilty as anyone of focusing myopically on my own issues and losing the perspective that often when we focus on what we've lost, we fail to see what we've gained. Look at his words, focus, perspective, myopia. This is a choice, friend. What do you zoom in on? What do you focus on? What perspective do you choose? Do you focus on what you've lost, what you're going through, how hard everything is, or do you focus on what you can gain, on how you can choose to feel more joyful? Look, this is self-brain surgery. This is biblical. It is good neuroscience. It is good self-care. You can choose to fill your container with hope. There's a law that, that, that determines and predicts the behavior of gas in a container. And the behavior will always be that whatever gas you put into a container will fill up that container. And the gas we're talking about today is suffering or joy. And you can choose to fill your container with hope. If you let the physics work for you, Instead of filling your life with the inevitable suffering that is available with no effort on your part, you can actually choose hope, and you can find joy, and you can find peace, and you can start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.